Well, let's look at Psalm 90, verse 1 this morning. Psalm 90, verse 1. I want to get, I'm going to get down to a later verse, but, I, you know, I like, well, there's a couple of verses I want to touch on, but I want to read the context, you know. Um, so you see the context this is in, and we're not just pulling something completely out of context here. It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Now, this is Moses writing this. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth or the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. Verse 7, for we have been consumed by your anger. Now, you know, you look at what the Israelites went through and what they did. They didn't follow God a lot. It's much more that they were not following God than what they were in their history. If you look at that, there's times when they're on. So Moses is referring to this. Moses himself, he got really mad with the people that were following. So this is the context, okay? God is a good God, but it does say he was angry with some things. But I want you to see some things, but I'm just relating to you the context. For, for we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath, we are terrified. You are set our iniquity, or you have set our iniquities before you. In other words, we've we messed up and that stuff's before you. Our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath, we finish our years like a sigh. Verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Verse 11, who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. Verse 12, and this is what I want to get to, so teach us to number our days. So he's saying, we've messed up a lot and we've dealt with a lot of stupid stuff. And then he says, verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So you've ever seen this verse, this is the context, but the, the, the truth of this stands, and we're going to read a lot of scripture to support it, but this is where I wanted to start. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In the NLT, it says, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. In the CEV, it says, teach us to use wisely all the time we have. In the Living Bible, it says, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Amen? Amen? So Moses is saying, show us. Help us to understand the days on, here on earth. They just, there's, not, there's not that many of them. They help us to spend them as we should, which is wisdom. Help us to have true wisdom. Let's look at Psalm 39, verse 4. Another verse that says uh, something similar before we go on. Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. In other words, get this money, but, you know, when you're gone, you don't know exactly where it's going to go. Sure, you have wills and everything, but you don't know how all that's going to go, ultimately. This is saying much the same thing. Verse 4, make me to know my end and what is the measure 
of my days. Indeed, that may know how frail I am. That means, you know, you, how little you are in the big scheme of things. Indeed, my, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you, which is a true statement. It's as nothing. Doesn't matter. You know, we go, oh, this person on the, the earth, they're old. They're a hundred. God's always been. So it, it is literally as nothing. When you look at the scale of time, you can't even see 100 years on forever. It's nothing. You can't see 80, 90. You can't see any of that. In the Amplified Classic, verses 4 and 5, it says, Lord, make me to know my end and to appreciate the measure of my days, which is a lot like what we read, the number of my days, to appreciate it. To appreciate it. In other words, to understand the measure of my days, what it, what it is, let, let me know and realize how frail I am, how transient is my stay here. How brief I'm going to be here. Where's here? On the earth. It's not long. Not a long time. Verse 5, behold, you have made my days as short as hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing in your sight. Truly every man at his best is merely a breath. And it says Selah. Selah means think about it. Here it says pause and think, think calmly of that. And think about it. I like the way it says that every man at his best is but a breath. Because you know it's easy to make a lot of what people do. You know, if you watch soccer, a World Cup's going on, and you see the, the current generation of people that are playing, and then you hear names, you know, they're in the stands of people that used to be on that same stage playing years ago, decades ago. They were the ones playing. They were in their prime. But they could not play with those guys on the field right now. I'm saying they couldn't, they couldn't keep up with them. Physically impossible. Doesn't matter how sharp they are mentally. Doesn't matter how much they understand the game. Their body can't do it anymore because they've moved on. It's just, they're not in their prime. They're not at their best. I mean, yeah, we remember some of them, but they're not on the stage anymore. But the world makes a lot. You gotta, you gotta look the world to say, ooh, this person's that or this person's that. It, you know, and they're, they're, look at how much they're doing, but the world forgets very quickly. And time moves on. And so they, these verses, and we're going to read more, they're saying, help me to understand what's really going on here. How short I'm going to be here. How short I'm going to live any part of my life. It's not going to look the same for my whole life. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But, you know, if you go back to uh, Psalm 90, let's look at Psalm 90, verse 12 there in the, the Living Bible. And just look at that one. It says, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. Now, I just did, you know, the math is pretty easy, but just for reference, let's just look at it a little bit. It says to number our days. Now, it's talking about appreciate the days, appreciate, appreciate how few they are. But... Look, look at, uh, you know, a year, of course, we know that's 365 days. Okay, so if we go from there, just some numbers just to put in scope so that you don't have to do the math while we're sitting here. 730 days is two years. So when you say two years, it's, it's got a number on it. It's just a little over 700 days, and you'll be two years through. Five years is 1,825 days, a little over 1,800 days is five years. Ten years, little over 3,600, 3,600 days. So if you go, so 18 years, the number of years typically a, a child is, you know, with their parents. That's little, it's 6,570 days. So a little bit over 6,500 days is 18 years. It's got a number on it. 20, 
years is 7,300. 30 years is just under 11,000. 50 years, a little over 18,000 days. That's it. 50 years seems like a long time, but it's 18,250 days. That's it. That's, that's how many days there are. 100 years, we think, that man, that's a, that's a long lifetime. That's 36,500 days. So they have a number. And they are very few. When you look at it like that, that's few. Just because it's thousands, when you think that's a lifetime, when you think 10 years from now, well, it's, it's, thir- it's 3,600 days, and that'll be 10 years. That means if you had that on your wall, you see that day counting down. You only got a little over 3,600 3, of them, and it's going to be 10 years. That means, the, yeah, the, that's the literal number. But the psalmist is saying, Moses is saying, psalmist is saying, help me to appreciate what that means, the brevity of that, so that what I can use those days right. I can use them properly, not to get stressed out about it, okay? This is, we're reading the Bible. I mean, literally, that's what the psalmist is saying is, show me this. So we're going over and meditating a little bit on this, and we're going to read other scriptures in the New Testament as well. This is something that they were saying, help me to do this. So this is something that we're doing. God, show me this. And we're just, just putting our eyes on it just for a few moments and looking at it. It's not to be depressing. It's not supposed to be depressing. It's not supposed to make you stressed out. It's not to say, oh my gosh, and freak out, and every 30 seconds I got to do... No, that's not... That would be unwisely using that time. Because anytime you're stressed, you're missing out. Anytime you're in remorse and regret, you're missing out on what is going on right now because time doesn't stop. I know this is sobering, but it, it, it's what the, the Bible talks about this numerous times. Think about this. Look at it. Why? So we can calibrate and say, am, am I being wise? Because I only got so many of these things. And the thing is, like I mentioned before, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. We, we sometimes act like what we're doing now is what we're going to keep doing forever. And if you, like, we're going to get, you know, we're working a certain job. And we go through a day like we get up, brush our teeth, go through our routine, go, go through our commute, go to work, come home, and act like that cycle is going to go on perpetually. And if you've lived very long at all, you know that's not true. I'm not talking about dying. We're saying transitions in life. Stuff changes. You know, you know you're going in a certain place. And you're just going, you're going like a job, and all of a sudden, you know, not all of a sudden, but, you know, in, in the scope of life, it's all of a sudden, it, there's a transition, and your last day comes. And you're not going to go there anymore the way you did. You know, you, you, you guys, uh, we've all grown up, and you students, you know this, and everybody that's been to school, I remember it distinctly. In fact, I marked it in my mind. It was very... Um, in the forefront of my understanding when I stood at different, in the, in the last few days of different schools and realized this is the last time this is going to happen. When I was in middle school, I remember, you know, going into high school uh, and how big that looked. Coming out of middle school, how big it looked. But then I, I, as I was getting done with high school, I distinctly, and I remember specifically being in the gym after graduation. I remember the days up to it, but I can see it right now in my mind in Omaha, Nebraska, at Burke High, dropping off my cap and gown, back, the stuff back into the high school, and looking around and saying, I will never be here again in this capacity. This is the last time I am here in any capacity as a high school student. I've been back there. I was back there after my, my brothers and sisters you know, went there, and we went there for the graduations. I drove by it when I was back in 
um, Nebraska, you know, earlier this year, but I didn't go into the building or anything, but just it's all renovated and see it. But I remember I, I drove past the football stadium where we had graduation and and I, it, the thought flashed through my mind. I can see the building and I know the gymnasium's in there and that's where I was that night. I have to do the math however many years ago. But that transition, I wasn't, you know, when you're going through that as a high school student, I remember distinctly getting up and, you know, rolling out of bed and going to school and pulling to the parking lot and going to try to not be late. And you think this is just going to go and all of a sudden that's decades ago. So that's a transition. Well, that happens over and over in our lives where you're doing something and it can be like, I got to do this or you just act like this is what's going to happen. So I have an infinite number of days, but we just looked at the math. There's not an infinite number of days. They're numbered. Not in a morbid sense of you're going to die. It's just the number of days that you're going to be doing anything has a literal number on it. And this shouldn't depress us, but it should. It could wake us up and realize wherever we're at, how are we looking at it? And are we looking at it wisely? Because these scriptures that we just read, they're saying, help me to understand this what? So we can go home and be depressed? No, so we can act wisely. So we can act wisely. Let's jump down. I want to... Uh, I'll just bring this out right now. Uh, can you go down to Ephesians 5, verse 11? <clears throat> we'll come back up, I think, but we'll do it this way. Ephesians 5, verse 11. Let's just jump down to verse 15. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. In the Amplified Classic, it says, look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately not as the unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people. Verse 16, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. Look at the way it says that. Making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity. Do you know that opportunities aren't infinite? There's, there's an opportunity each day in different areas to interact with people, to do certain things, you know, maybe, you know, at your job, in your profession, um, opportunities in, all, in every area of life, but there's certain things that you... you you see a certain person, you only have a certain number of opportunities to see them. And sometimes we just, it's lost on us, I think, you know, because the world's busy. The world will try to get you busy and distract you from what we're talking about here. Forget that, let's just go back to just, let's just come out and grind and just act like, oh, yeah, I know, but I'm busy. Busy with what? And are we too busy? Could we be not actually, are we being busy with things that are actually, when we look back on certain things, they're actually the things that we'll say that was a wise use of that time. Again, when this is saying make the most of time and buy up each opportunity and before, it, uh, you know, in the previous verse, live purposely and wordly and accurately, it's we don't need to be stressed like that, like, oh my goodness, that means every five minutes I better be doing the exact right thing, and if I do it wrong, then it's messed up and everything's going to blow apart. That's using it wrong. That's not being at peace. That's not walking in the wisdom of God. I'm not talking about being high-strung about life. 
because there are times the thing you're supposed to be doing is being very low-key and just enjoying the people around you. And you're buying up that opportunity and buying up that time. You are just, I know there's many times, we just, we just had Thanksgiving, just look around the room. You know? And you just enjoy, there's a fire. And we have all of our kids and all of our family there. And just enjoy that snapshot. And that's what you're supposed to be doing. It wouldn't do any good to stress out, what else can I get done? I'm doing this right now. This is what we're doing. You know, right now we're hearing the word of God. Which will affect, like stuff like this can affect every part of our life. You know, we don't do this together, hopefully. We don't gather together like this just so we can check a box and say, hey, I did that for the week. No, this is going before God because we believe, you know, his word told us not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. Why? So that we keep our eyes on him because there's so much distraction. And so this is vital. This is important. What we're doing right now is giving God an opportunity to help us and to course correct if needed. I've been talking about every time we come together because God can just, he just keeps us going up and shows us thing and things and brings us up in, in our walk with him. So it's important. It's important what we do uh, with our opportunities. Look at another verse that says something similar. Colossians 4, verse 2. It says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, meanwhile praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. You know, when we talk about when we pray before, this is like one of the scriptures. May help pray for me. That, we could, that I'd, I'd, I'd be able to speak the mystery of Christ as I ought to. Make it manifest. That means make it clear. That's why we pray those things. We're, we're just like the Apostle Paul. Help me. Help me to do it so I can make it clear. Next verse, verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward those are, who are outside redeeming the time. Verse 5 in the Amplified, it says, Conduct yourself with wisdom in your interactions with outsiders, non-believers. Make the most of each opportunity, treating it as something precious. Now, this is referring to, you know, in context, it's, it's talking about opportunities with uh, people that don't believe, but this obviously applies across the board. Whatever the opportunity is, whoever you're with, you make the most of the opportunity, Again, not stressing out about it, but making the most of it. Treating it as something precious. Because time is our most precious resource. It's not money. If you have infinite time, you can make infinite money, right? Doesn't matter how much you make an hour, but you don't have infinite time. Everybody has 24 hours a day. And so, and you have only so many days, like we saw. So time is precious. Well, each opportunity is precious. For what? For what? How are we going to know what to do? How are we going to know? Look at Proverbs 3, uh, 9, verse 10. Go back up to Proverbs 9, verse 10. A few verses back. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is the fear of the Lord? It's the reverence of God. It's going to God. It's, it's talking exactly about what we're saying here. Lord, show me. You show me. How short life is that I can walk wisely, so I can walk in wisdom, so I can use it. Well, you going to God is, that's the beginning of knowing how to do that, of what I do. I'm going to God. In other words, I believe there's a God. 
And I believe He's given me time on this earth. And I believe He knows what I should do. And so then I'm going to fear the Lord is the reverence of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom in every area. Well, when we're talking about this, how to know what to do, how to, to understand. Yes, generally to understand the number of our days, but understand also, okay, what does that mean for me? Well, generally speaking, yes, we understand we have a, a number of days and uh, we're going to be here for a limited time, but what does that mean for my life? Because there's so many things in the world that are pulling on us. It's so busy. It's so active, you know, active. There's so many activities. There's so many uh, pulls on our time, and there's so many pulls on our, our attention that if we're not careful, see, if we don't have this attitude that I have to go to God and ask Him and believe Him to help me to see, we can be distracted and we can be then spending whole parts of our time of our life on things that really, at the end, at the end of, of uh, the end analysis, didn't really impact or didn't really matter like they could have because our opportunities... We didn't use them like we could have. Well, how are you going to know that? You have to know God's the only one that can help you with that. To know that, number one, His things are first. And that regardless of how, that, that the way He sees is so much different than the way we see. Like we read you don't have to go flip back there, but I'll just read it to you in, in Psalm 90, verse 4. It said, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past. And like a watch in the night. That means it's like last night. A thousand years in God's sight is just like last night. Yeah, I'll just quote this to you. Uh, 2 Peter 3, verse 8 says... Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand, is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So God has a different way of looking than we do. He doesn't, he doesn't look the way people do. And He certainly doesn't look the way unsaved people do, the way the spirit of the world is. And so the world does act. In many cases, they will act like you're going to do the same thing over and over, and it's not going to change. You know, I remember talking to a, uh, a person uh, that was a lot younger than me, and, um, you know, in, in, in his life, he was working a ton uh, of hours and uh, enjoying doing it, but, you know, he would have... Uh, He'd be doing all his stuff, and then he'd be there for everybody else to ask to do their stuff. And I talked to him, and, you know, he was, he was opening up. He was asking me, and I said, you know, because this man was single at that point, and I said, you know, at some point, you're going you're gonna to get married. And at some point, you're going to have children. And if you don't make space for those things now, like, you can't get used to what, you, what you're doing is probably, you're, you're doing more than you need to. And so you'll get used to that, and it's going to be harder for you to break out of it when you have these things in your life. You're going to have to make room for other stuff. And that's what the world will, and, and you know, over time, that's what he did. I you know, talked to him at different points, and he's like, that... Those are really good things that we talked about. But that's what the world will do. It'll get you focused on what's going on now, and this is what you got to do, and you have to because, you know, it's urgent. There's deadlines. We have to do this. And the world will chew you up and spit you out and get another one over and over and over. And if we let it, that's what they'll do to us. And no, won't bat an eye. Because that's the spirit of the world. We can't determine what we're supposed to do by what other people are demanding of us. 
We determine what we're supposed to do by what God is leading us, what His Word says, number one, what is important in His eyes, number one, and then He's going to lead you specifically in what He wants you to do. But it, it, we have to have the mentality that God is on the throne, that His perspective is right, and His things are more important than anything else. That has to be the context where we, we make decisions. Otherwise, we will get sidetracked. We'll get caught up in what somebody else's agenda is. Unbeknownst to us, we're, doing, we're, we're helping somebody else to do what they want to get done at the expense of what we really ought to be doing. Not saying we ought to be the best workers and best employees anywhere. That doesn't mean you, you do it in a way that is sacrificing what is truly important or sacrificing your, your, your true purpose and your true calling or things that have to do with things that are irreplaceable like your health or like time with your family or anything. No, you can be an excellent worker, be very efficient without doing some of those things. But the world won't tell you that. The world will just pull on you and then get, get us busy, and it's a numbing effect. It's easier just to be busy than it is to follow God. Did you hear me? It's easier to stay busy and to just put your head back down and just keep working and just going on the same course than it is to get quiet and to look at it and say, am I, am I doing what I need to do? Exactly what Moses said. Show me how brief this thing is so that I can act wisely. Because if, if you knew you only had so many days to do something, you might make different decisions. I'm only going to be in this place for this many more days. I want to spend all of it doing this? Or is there something else maybe I better start moving toward? And said, so just keeping my head down and the days are about to end and oh, they're done and now I realize... I'm done with that? Now I'm doing this? Man, I would have done that differently if I really realized that. Again, we're not talking about regret. We can't, we talk, we can't go back. Okay? Don't let the devil get that, get, you know, jump on your shoulder and try to be, oh, you should have done that. That's, that's not God. What we're saying is, help me to spend the time in front of me because regret is just wasting the time I have now remorse is going to cripple me now. That's the worst thing we can do. If I, if I should have done something else, then I can ask God, help me to do the right thing now because that's all I have the ability to change. But God will help me. But part of it is we got we to gotta lift up our eyes. I'm not just talking about just this horizon when we're done, when we're out of here, we're not talking about at a funeral either. Yeah, that's okay. That's part of people say, well, what do you want people to say about you? It's not what people are going to say about you. What does God say about you? And what did your life do for his purposes? It's not what people say, but yes, we want to have a good report. Yes, we know what that means. But I'm saying there's a higher. I don't know about you, but what I want is when I meet Jesus. I want to hear certain words come out of his mouth. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You did what I asked you to do. It doesn't matter what people say. It's what God says. Well, we, we have that, these days that we're talking about, the sum of them is our life in any given segment. It's what we have left to do. On this earth, however many, how long it is, we don't know when Jesus is going to come back. What we do know is that, you know, he has got a plan for us now. He knows when it's going to all wind up. But we do know some things. You know, you put this in the context, it starts to put a lot of things that we can preach on individually into context. So if you only have so many days, if you're worrying about what's going to happen with those days when you know they're going to end anyway, that's like a really bad use of time. 
if you get mad at, at everybody around you that's going on the journey with you, that's like a really bad use of time. It's going to make the journey really inefficient, right? If we, you know, it's, it's not about a, a, a religious to-do list of what we do with our time as far as, well, I got to go to church. <laughs> if we look at it like that, if we looked at it, I have so many days. I want to use them right. I need to know God. I need his wisdom. That's an investment. It is, I need to have people around me that are going to run with me to get to the place where I really want to be, and I know I can't do it alone. It puts these things in context. It puts things clear because we, we don't have forever in any given segment. Look at James 4, verse 13. It says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. We don't. Are we reading the New Testament or not? Yes, we are. Can you know, can you be led by the Spirit and know what you need to do? Yes. But you can't put your own interpretation on it. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Does anybody want to stand up and say, actually, I do? You don't. I don't. We don't know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. What we do need to know, we know God. And we need to do, do what He is telling us to do at any given time. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And here's, some, here's another thing. See, sometimes we get an impression and a leading of what we're supposed to do, and if we're not careful, you can put your own interpretation on that and say that must mean such and such is going to happen. Don't do that. That's called presumption. We assume in our limited understanding, if God's having me do this, that must mean such is going to happen. Did he say that? Now, if he told you, that's, why, that's one thing. But sometimes we connect the dots where there's no dots to connect. And then when stuff comes down, you're like, well, but I thought... It was going to, you told me, I thought it was going to happen like this. Did he tell you that? See, well, and then, see, then people are tempted to, to somehow blame God or, or get mad. No, let's just stick with what he told us to do. And this is what this is talking about. We want to be led be, by God, but we don't want to fall into being arrogant or presumptuous. Verse 14 says, where is, okay, let's read 13 again. Come now, you, you who say today or, and, or tomorrow we're going to go to such and such a city, spend a, a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. See, okay, this sounds, we, we, we just been doing a series on what you say, right? What you say is important. And what we say is important in declaring what God has, what wants us to do. But you don't start saying stuff. you got to watch the line between if he told you to do something and you're saying that, that's one thing. But there's a line there where you can get into being arrogant about it and start saying this when you don't really know what, what is going to happen. And that's what James is talking about. Verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is. It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. So he's talking about that. But what I wanted to focus on, we go to God and say, what do you want me to do? That's what I'm going to do because my life is short. I don't have time to just bump into the walls and figure everything out by trial and error. He can show us what we need to do with this limited time that we have even when we don't know everything that's coming. He can lead us and guide us and help us to go in steps that, is, that are making the best use of our time, making the best of every opportunity even when we don't know everything that's around the corner. Because he can, 
He knows we don't know everything. But if we'll reverence Him, go to Him, He can show us what we need to know in context of the bigger picture of doing His will and realizing that's the most important and realizing His plan and purpose are what's going to stand for all eternity. And so with that context, He can show us what we need to do so that we're effective and efficient in these opportunities even though we don't know everything that's coming. But what we do know is that we're going to serve Him. We're going to do what He wants us to do. We're not going to get sidetracked. And so as we go through these different places in life where things do end, things come to an end, that we look back and say, with every, we may not have done it perfect. In fact, I'd say we probably aren't going to do it perfect. But with everything we knew, we followed the Lord, and He has us where He needs us at this time. And we don't look back with regret. We don't look back going, oh, I wish. We're saying, yeah, I mean, best of my ability, I followed him, and now I'm here. Now I'm at the next place. And we're marching through life with these opportunities, with these limited number of days, and using them to the glory of God. And that brings a satisfaction then. We... Like Moses said, show me so I can walk wisely. Well, what is wisdom? It's the right application of knowledge. So when we get to a place, we look back and go, wisdom is going to stand for the test of time. You're going to look and say, I did the wise thing. I did something that held up that I, I'm glad I did. That I didn't spend time going after something that in retrospect Wow, that was such a waste. It didn't have anything to do with the kingdom of God. Not looking at something that everybody else is doing and they think that's the best thing to do and if we just do it that way, we're following the spirit of the world, we're going to miss God. But doing it according to what he would have us do. Let's close with this, this illustration. Luke 12, verse 13. This is a powerful illustration here. It's from Jesus, Jesus saying this. So then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Right there, boy, what is inheritance? Money. How many fights and rifts have been caused by money? People's lives, not keeping their eye on what is truly important. Verse 14, so somebody's coming to Jesus and say, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Verse 14, but he, Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Saying, that, no, this is not my business. You want me to tell him what to do? It's not, nobody made me judge over you. Verse 15, and he said to them, take heed and be aware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Now, this is talking specifically about this, covetous in the amount we possess, but I want you to look at it in light of what we've been talking about in, in whatever would be obtained through our time and our efforts that could be, it could be accolades, it, it could be high performance in a certain area, but, but look at it in context of everything we've talked about and what Jesus is saying, because the same principles apply here. If we, don't, if we aren't doing something that is actually worthwhile and valuable in the long haul. Verse 15, take, take, he said to them, Take heed and be aware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses, nor does it consist in the things you accomplish unless it's for the kingdom of God. No matter the number of degrees, doesn't matter the number of people you know, doesn't matter your title at work, doesn't matter how many patents you have or whatever. Those are all good things, but that's not what it consists of. Verse 16, then he spoke a parable to them, saying, the, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. Don't build big barns. And there I will store all my crops and all my goods, or my goods. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many good goods laid up for many years. 
take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things go be which you have provided? Verse 21, so, he is, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, of course, this applies to money. He's, this guy's like, I got so much stuff. What am I going to do? I can't hold all my stuff. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my little barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to store my stuff, and I'm all set for years. Except then God tells him, your days are done. He's not, we're not talking about God taking somebody. He's saying, your life is over. Those days that were numbered, it's at one. And this is the last night and you're at zero. All those years that you're talking about, you won't be here. You're gone. You're done. In other words, your days have come to an end. You think it's going to keep going. The way you, he's, this is exactly what we're talking about. I, he thinks I have years to do this, and in fact, it's not true. You could apply that to any phase in our life. The fact is, right now, we have things in our life that we can use and enjoy, and we have people around us, and we have so many things that we have opportunities to fully partake in and fully enjoy and use for the kingdom of God. And sometimes we're distracted by all this stuff going, no, but I got to do something else, thinking that an opportunity in front of us is going to be forever. We're not talking about dying. We're talking about just a place in life. And this, Jesus is given this parable saying, don't do this. Look to God. And so that we know there is going to be a limit to what we're, how long we're uh, running on this earth. And so we want to store up treasure in heaven, not just financially, but doing the things that God would have us do to do. And he's got something for each of us. He's got a path. And he is so merciful, so kind, so generous that if we'll ask, he'll show us. He'll show us how to unwind things. He'll show us how to clear out things. He'll show us how to keep moving for him. And as we move on, then we're going to, we're not going to look back with regret. We're going to say, Lord, I knew. I asked you to the best of my ability. I did what you told me to do there and there and there. And that phase is over. Didn't do it perfect. But man, I, I know that I was walking with you and we can enjoy then and do it for his glory. Amen. Amen.